We're here live in a, we have a live studio audience. So let's have a hand for the best introducer in the world, Patricia. <laughs> We're gonna start with a little, little song about the relationship between books and readers. And it goes like this. There is nobody like a book. Just open one and take a look. You'll find a world of wonder there. Turn on the light, pull up a chair. Turn a page, turn one more. Every page becomes a door. So open one and take a look. There is nobody like a book. Let's read alone or with a friend from start to end and then again. You read to me, I'll read to you, and we can be book buddies too. We can be book buddies too. There is nobody like a book. There is nobody like a book. Open one and take a look. There is nobody like a book. Y'all can clap now. I'm going to hand this to my sister, who's in the, who happens to be in the audience today. My name is Alan Wolf, and that was a song that was celebrating this particular book called Nobody Like a Book. It's one of my first picture books. And the reason I'm bringing these up is because the book we're talking about today, which is Behold Our Magical Garden is part of a long history of books that involve poetry and research, beginning with this book called The Blood Hungry Spleen and other poems about our parts. Every time I say the word spleen, I need for you to gasp in horror. Spleen, <gasps> spleen, <gasps> spleen, spleen. <gasps> yeah, exactly. Also this book called The Day the Universe Exploded My Head. Every time I say exploded, I want you all to go, <laughs> let's give it a shot, exploded. Exploded, exploded, exploded. Yeah, you got it. So this next one, which is called Behold Our Magical Garden, is just a, in another long line of things that I loved to research. And I'm gonna run you through this book really quickly. I'm gonna read the opening poem. And then we have lots of guests here. We have Jordan Diamond from Feast who was one of the inspirations for this book by uh, creating the garden that she created at Lucy Herring Elementary School. Uh, we also have a special reading by a fourth grader named Davis Reynolds, who is also, he's a fourth grader from uh, Lucy Herring. Also, you will be joined by two of my sons and a special beatboxer named Mars Mignon, and they're going to be here as well virtually. Uh, and we're also going to play a little game called Name That Sprout, and we're going to have a crunch, a carrot crunch off. So hold on to your, your rutabagas. Here we go. Behold our magical garden. This book is a long time in the making, and the awesome, awesome illustrations were by Daniel Duncan, who lives in London. I asked Daniel Duncan if he would join us here, but he said, oh, no, I am shy. And so he said I could talk for him. And I just wanted to point out the awesome illustrations that he has created for us here. Um, and some of my favorites, and check out this. This is called the end paper. Everybody say end paper. End paper. There you go. And that's these little papers here. And I just love the little gnome and the carrot and the trowel and the little bee. And that is the, the, the title page there. And I want to point out too, it is dedicated to these three ladies, Jen, Abby, and Ginger. Ginger's my wife, Jen is my neighbor, and Abby is, was my neighbor, and they started a garden called the Falconhurst Community Garden, and it was these three ladies that sort of inspired me to start writing poems about gardens, and so I've dedicated this book to the three of them, and then, of course, my children started going to Vance Elementary School. Now it's called Lucy Herring. And there's an awesome garden there called this Peace Garden. That's why we have Jordan Diamond here to tell us all about it. Uh, this is Daniel Duncan's version of it. 
here. And I'm going to read the first poem, the opening poem from the book. It's called Behold Our Magical Garden. And you'll see in it that there are all sorts of little things and you can try to pick and find out the different things that are in here. It's sort of like Where's Waldo, but with lots of different things. And it goes like this. Behold our magical garden. In our garden, can you see a bird, a bug, a bumblebee, a leaf, a breeze, a dogwood tree? Behold our magical garden. And if you're here in the studio audience with me, go ahead and say, behold our magical garden. Behold our magical garden. Oh, they're going nuts here. In our garden, what's in store? A tool shed with a broken door, a stray cat with a lion's roar. Behold our magical garden. In our garden, can you see an ear of corn, a pack of seeds, a teepee made of greenery? Behold our magical garden. In our garden, can you spy a winding path where kids walk by, a berry bush, a butterfly? Behold our magical garden. In our garden, can you see a compost bin, some broccoli, rain barrels, shovels, pumpkins, peas, Behold our magical garden. In our garden, can you find a bucket and a ball of twine, a finger painted welcome sign? Behold our magical garden. In our garden, can you see a grand adventure and it's free, a green delicious fantasy? Behold our magical garden. Let's have a hand for our audience today. They're awesome and what good readers they are. And so you're going to hear some of these. We grow it for ourselves. Uh, we're going to take some measurements. Here are kids taking measurements. All of these poems take place in a school that has a, a school garden. Uh, garden Wonders. This is a self-portrait. I actually asked him to draw it this way. This is me, the little guy. And I'm about to be devoured by various bugs and birds. And let's see, what else could I tell you? Um, there's a poem about germination, see there. And what you're gonna see Jordan and I do is called uh, Greenhouse Guesses, where we're gonna, we're gonna do an interview with some sprouts. I've got some sprouts in the studio. We're gonna meet March of the Garden Volunteers. And look at that, here's a book about, a uh, poem about thyme and other herbs. And I love, 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 here's, a, here's a, a poem about how to say different vegetables in Latin so you can impress your friends at the lunchroom table. You're going to hear Diary with a Carrot actually read by an actual fourth grader who might actually read this book one day. Um, the Three Sisters, you can't have a garden poem without a poem about three sisters, a potato poem. And uh, here's a poem. I'm not gonna belabor this too much, but if you see, this is called a concrete poem and it's called poetry. And there's actually a poem about the top of the tree, a poem about the trunk and a poem about the roots. Those are three poems combined into one concrete poem. And I began working on that poem probably 40 years ago and it's finally ended up on the page. Here's one I'm not gonna read for you, but I just wanna bring up the, the humor of the thing. Um, it's called Good, Bad, Good Bug, Bad Bug, uh, uh, or what I say, the good, the bad, and the bugly. And you can see it's got lots of uh, Western, uh, spaghetti Western sort of allusions to it, but no guns. Look at that, they're like about to shoot each other, but they don't have any guns, which is, you know, that's, that's, that's what we do in the garden. We don't have guns in the garden. Two of my favorite spreads, look at the beautiful artwork here. This is about flowers, garden flowers. And this one is about the, gar the garden birds that help us out. I just really love the artwork that uh, Daniel Duncan has created. Hopefully I'll have time to do this one called Attila the Hen and the Mystical Eggplant, uh, based on a true story. And, um, Lastly, we're probably we're definitely going to do the FBI of compost, which is a little wrap thing, fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates. Something that I want to bring up to you now, if you read the poem about the popcorn, you'll see, and if you see in that right there, that's the um, 
I guess that that's the, uh, the the teacher who makes popcorn, that the popcorn teacher, I guess. But you'll see the the clock. The clock there says one twenty eight. One twenty eight, or it should. I don't know if that's backward, but one twenty eight is the birthday of my daughter Jameson, who loves popcorn. January twenty eighth, and so and then it ends with this spread, which is the same garden, but now covered up in snow because now it's winter. And in the back of the book, you're going to see a whole author's note. And these are all different notes about the different poems. And it explains a little bit about how the poems came to be and how the poems work as poems and how you can actually present the poems. And so that's a good little rundown of this book, Behold Our Magical Garden. And I want to bring on right now to play a certain game. I'm going to bring on uh, Jordan Diamond. And uh, as, as I bring her on, um, I want to tell you that this book was inspired. First of all, let's have a hand for Jordan. Jordan, how are you doing? I'm good. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Hi. Everybody say hi. She just hi, said hi. Jordan. Hi, Jordan. Jordan um, when I started working on this book, I was working with uh, a, a lady named Abby Walker, and I asked her to put together some materials for me so I could begin, begin my research, because I wanted to know what kids in a school garden curriculum would, uh, would see, and what, what, so what I needed to focus on, and what poems I needed to work on. And she introduced me to the organization that you are involved with called FEAST, F-E-A-S-T. She was a classroom teacher at Francine Delaney at the time. And uh, she was so instrumental. And I know that FEAST was actually begun by Kathy Cleary and Kate Justin. And we have them to thank for the legacy of this amazing thing. And I just wanted you to come on and and uh, everybody, every time I would say, I need to talk to somebody about community uh, class gardens, they always said Jordan Diamond is the go-to. And I have been looking at the community garden, or I'll call it the Peace Garden at Lucy Herring, even since back in the days when it was Vance, because my children both went, went to school there in elementary school. And my wife and I still take walks there in the evening. We see the sunset from there. And um, we look at your handiwork all the time and we have you to thank for that. So I'm really happy to have you come on here and help us do some poems, do a little crunch off. And maybe um, you could take this opportunity now to tell us a little bit about what Feast is because I'm just learning about this myself. Could you tell us some, a little bit about it? Sure. Thanks for that awesome introduction. I'm really honored to be here. Um, so FEAST, it stands for Fresh, Easy, Affordable, Sustainable, and Tasty. And it is now a program of a larger organization called Bountiful Cities. So we're part of this larger work in food security and community gardens. And FEAST uh, does uh, programming is in schools and our two flagship schools are Lucy Herring Elementary and Hall Fletcher Elementary. We also have a program at uh, Francine Delaney and we teach classes at a couple of other schools as well. Um, but at those three schools, we also manage the gardens and um, I am the, the program coordinator and I run the program at Lucy Herring, which is this big, beautiful garden that I am blessed to have inherited uh, back in 2012 and have been stewarding ever since. And the kids at the school are a large part of that garden too, and the community is as well. Um, so I like to tell everyone it's our garden. You know, the kids plant the, the plants, they sift the compost and they harvest and take home the, the produce. So it really is a, a hub for the community and the school. And you do some work too, um, uh, coordinating with So True Seeds here, right? Lo a local seed company. Tell us about what's that. What is that relationship you have with them? Um, so So True Seed has sponsored the feast program this year, and they have given us a generous gift certificate so we can buy seeds and other supplies that we need. And we are also um, hoping to do some workshops and work days with them as a staff and the community. 
And they also have given us a couple of varieties of seeds that we are testing out for them that they aren't selling yet, but they want information about. So we have a variety of carrots and radishes and lettuce that we've started um, that hopefully we'll make it through this, this winter that we're having uh -huh. today. Yeah. Um, and then we'll give them that info about how those seeds grow and taste. Uh, can you tell me, do, do your students get to eat their homework? Oh, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, we have a, a period of time at the end of every class called free time where the kids get to harvest things in the garden and I show them whatever is, you know, big and ready for them to eat and they're shoving fresh kale and pea shoots and peppers <laughs> into their mouths and running back into the building with it in their pockets. Um, and then, you know, in the warm months, they get to take home bags of, of veggies that are har they're harvesting. Yeah, I, I, um, I've met doing a TED talk earlier this week, ironically, I met a fourth grader there, uh, Davis Reynolds. He was actually one of the TED talk speakers and he apparently just loves the garden. And he was telling me, this wasn't even uh, you know, necessarily part of his talk, but he was telling me, he was telling me about, he was really opening up to me about anxieties that he has. And he was telling me he really loves to be in the garden and be with the plants. He also likes animals a lot. Um, uh, can you tell me just a little bit about, tell everybody a little bit about what kids get out of gardening, uh, not just scientifically speaking, but what do they get emotionally out of it? I mean, first and foremost, they're getting a connection to nature and a connection to their food, which a lot of people don't have, especially in urban environments. And mm -hmm. for many of the students at our school, they, they may not have access to a yard or a garden or nature spaces. So for a lot of our students, this is their only access to nature and growing food um, and even fresh food mm -hmm. sometimes. They also yeah. get, you know, an opportunity to get their hands in the dirt, which is therapeutic and reduces anxiety. And they get to learn outdoors. We're taking, you know, the things they're learning in math and reading and science, and we're applying them to the garden. And I think that that helps give them a tangible sense of like why it's important to learn to read or write or do math um, and what all of those subject matters mean in the real world. Um, and they get to eat. They love eating. Um, right. And, you know, they're trying new things. They're they're opening up their minds to new foods, and they're also working together. And you know, getting a sense of responsibility because I'm giving them shovels and tools and wheelbarrows, and you know, <laughs> they get to see that like they have this impact. Like they put this seed in the ground and it grows, and then they get to eat something off of it, and you know they get to see how that all connects in a cycle. Yeah, I, I just love the idea of you handing shovels and hoes to these kids and just like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's great. Well, how do you just plug it in? <laughs> <laughs> and I love the that it's just built in multimodal and it's cross-curricular. And I remember back in the early days when Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences was a big thing in education, how one of the intelligence was actually gardening. It was uh, nature intelligence. I can't remember the exact name of it, but that was, you know, you could, you could be a genius just because you had a green thumb. And for some reason you could do that. You know, I just, I love that. Um, well, are, are, are you uh, open to doing a little, a little uh, poem with me called Greenhouse Guesses? Yes, I've been practicing my sprout voices. <laughs> All right. Well, I can't wait to see that. But before you do it, we have to play a little game and you can play at home with this. It's called Name That Sprout. My wife came home with some very interesting plants in tiny little pots and they were supposed to be given to house guests, but at the end of the dinner party, we forgot to give them out. So we got all these little pots full of little plants. And first, I, I, want, to, I want to see if you know uh, this first one right here. Can you tell us what those little guys are? Aren't they cute? And They're this so is cute. 
This, uh, and this is not one of the, the little house plants. This is actually one that my wife planted from seed. And so these, these little guys, literally, they're like, uh, they're like, they're not even toddlers yet. They're just like, wah, wah. can you tell what those little guys are? My first guess is that they're sunflowers. They look like little sunflower sprouts. No. Are they lettuce? Yes. Everybody, let's have a hand for Jordan. <laughs> All right, you got one. That's it. So it's lettuce. Oh, those, are, okay. those are little lettuces. We love our lettuce. Now, here's one that's really kind of weird and scary. <laughs> Have you ever seen anything like that? No. <laughs> are you sure that's not like some kind of octopus whose tentacles are tied together? <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what this is either, so I can't really back you up. I think some people have called it a snake plant. Is that right, audience? <laughs> One lady who's very smart in the audience is saying, yes, yeah, snake plant. And I think it looks sort of like if you were, like somebody's hair braided, like you could pull this out and there's a big green head under like a troll. <laughs> and uh, lastly, before we do our palm, can you guess what this is? Is that a really sad lavender plant? <laughs> <laughs> I bet that this plant dreams of one day being a lavender plant. This is the kind of a plant you'd find it more near the ocean. Okay. And probably in the sea. Okay. It looks like some kind of succulent almost, but you say it's from the sea, so it can't be a succulent. <laughs> I, <want> to... <laughs> I don't we... know. This is a new one for me. All right. Well, this, this plant, we found it in Mexico growing by the ocean. So we think that it is Mexican seaweed and we <laughs> smuggled it in. I think it's probably really illegal. <laughs> But anyway, it's taken over the whole house now. <laughs> it's everywhere. We keep it contained. We have machetes everywhere. So let's read this poem. It's called Greenhouse uh, Guesses. And for you older kids at home, there's a whole lot of uh, grown up uh, jokes in it. Like Greenhouse Guesses is the name of this uh, poem, but it's actually a play on greenhouse gases, of course. And so I'm going to play the part of, I'm going to read the part of the narrator and uh, the uh, Jordan will do uh, her uh, sprout, vocal sprout stylings as we do this poem. And it goes like this. Five little sprouts in a greenhouse tray, dreaming of the plants they'll become one day. The first little prout Plant, uh, the first little sprout with a magical chant says, Maybe I'm a sun gold tomato plant. The second little sprout says, Oh my gosh, maybe I'm zucchini or an acorn squash. <laughs> the third little sprout says, Maybe I'm a pea or a bean or a carrot or a broccoli. The fourth little sprout thinks long and hard. Maybe I'm a spinach or a lettuce or a chard. The fifth little sprout says, What will I be? Maybe I'm the world's tallest redwood tree with an eagle's nest at the very tip top and leaves of gold and an ice cream shop. The moral is, no matter how small they seem, even little sprouts can dream big dreams. Let's have a hand for Jordan. <laughs> Jordan, that was awesome. I need to take you on the road with me. I particularly <laughs> like the people, the pea, the pea voice was very good, very well. Yeah. Hey, uh, do you do you happen to have a carrot with you? I have my carrot. Does everybody have their carrot at home? 
Here, the Jordan has the the carrot with hair, and I've got the bald carrot. Patricia's at, at Malaprops with her carrot. And what we're going to do is we're all going to crunch our carrots at the same time. So everybody unmute. And we're going to crunch. It's going to be a cacophony, a train wreck of carrot chewing. So get up next to that next to your your microphone. Here we go. Ready? Go. Everybody on it, stay up, stay up. Okay. Now, I don't want you to keep eating because I was warned not to do this because there may be a choking hazard at home. So I want you to stop chewing now, put your carrots down, and make sure you chew it up nice and try not to talk as you do this. But what we're gonna do, I'm gonna go to screen sharing now we're going to say goodbye to Jordan just for a little while. Bye, Jordan. Bye, Jordan. And I'm going to do a little screen sharing here. And I'm going to introduce this little kid, Davis Reynolds. And he's going to read us his poem called, no, the poem from the book called Diary of a Carrot. And it goes like this. Go for it, Davis. My name is David Reynolds, and I'm reading Diary of a Carrot by Alan. Day one. I suddenly wake up. It is dark. I think I'm a baby chick hatching from my shell. shell. Sleep. Day three. I am not a baby chick. I seem to have a long white tail. I think I'm a mouse. Sleep. Day ten. I am not a mouse. I wiggle down into the dirt. I think I am a worm. Day 20. I am not a worm. I am twice as long now. Slender strange strands eh, reach out. I think I am a snake with hair. Day 30. I am not a hairy snake. But now long green blades are reaching out from my head. I think I am a helicopter. Hooray! Day 45. I am not a helicopter. The green blades have multiplied the sprout. They sprout from my head like tentacles. I feel the water all around. I think I am an octopus. Day 60. I am not an octopus. A rabbit nibbles on my hair. It tickles, hidden in the dirt. My body grows thicker. So much, so much waiting. I don't know what I, what I am. Day 75. An exciting day. I feel a yank on my hair. I am raised in the air. I am tossed in a basket with others like me. I think it's my birthday party. Hooray! Day 77. This is not my birthday party. A human cuts off all my hair and chop, chop, chops me up. I think I am dinner. Day 78. Spent all day in the dark. Last thing I heard was crunch, crunch, crunch. Then, mmm, I think that was delicious. No! <laughs> Let's have a hand for Davis Reynolds. He's awesome. He was, I wanted him to be here live or virtually, but he had a soccer game. So we, uh, we had him do a little pre, uh, pre taping. And as y'all are uh, eating your carrots, I'm going to, I'm going to show you now a poem. It's, it's a poem for two voices. And a lot of the poems in this book are actually really good for people to read together. You might've heard um, Davis's dad, Matt, he was uh, reading part of that poem too. And what I'm going to do is now a poem called Raindrops. And I have a couple people from the audience, actually the whole audience is going to read the, the part of the raindrops. And you can see how it's laid out here. And I'm going to read the part of the rain, of the water. It's a two voice poem inspired by Paul Fleischman and his two voice poems. And it goes like this. It's called Water Lines, poem for two voices. Hit it, drip drops. Go for it. Drip drop, drip drop. Water from the rain cloud. Drip drop, drip drop. Water on the rooftop. Drip, drop, drip, drop. Water down the downspout. Drip, drop, drip, drop. 
Water in the rain barrel. Water in the drip hose. Water in the water can. Water on the green plants. Water on the wet ground. Water all around. Let's have a hand for the drips. <laughs> <laughs> the we, years and years in the practice of that one, folks. Um, want to introduce you now to. Uh, I'm going to do screen sharing one more time, and I'm going to take you now to um, a, an early version of a poem that you'll find in the book. It's called "The FBI of Compost," and this is one of the things I first learned from the whole the whole feast curriculum. In composting, you have F, which is for fungus. B, which is for bacteria, and I is for invertebrates. And those are the three main players in composting. And so I thought, okay, well, FBI of compost sort of sounds like it would be a good, a good little rap. And so I'm joined here in an early version. I'll, I'll, um, I'll write these poems in multiple voices, and then I'll encourage uh, house guests and family members to try the different parts out with me. So here's an early version. You'll see my son, Simon, my son, Ethan. Those are the big tall ones. And then you'll see me, I'm the middle size one. And then you'll see the one a little bit shorter is our beatboxer, Mars Mignon. So check this out. You'll also see a dog. I think it's Boudreaux, the dog, who is, uh, there we go. You'll see him too. This is called the FBI of compost. FBI of compost from Our Magical Garden by Alan Wolf. Wolf. Break it all down. Break it all down. Break it all down. Break it all down. Organic decomposers. Break it all down. Table scrap disposers. Break it all down. Composting composers. Break it all down. Fungus and bacteria. Invertebrates abound. We're in the FBI and we break it all down. Fuzzy moldy wonder bread. Fungus in the bin. Mushrooms in the flower bed. Put them in the bin. Fuzzy moldy wonder bread. Mushrooms all around. The fungus is among us. We break it all down. Billions of bacteria. Billions in the bin. Biomass hysteria. Put them in the bin. Tiny near invisible and army indivisible. Bacteria is responsible for breaking, breaking it down. Vigorous invertebrates. Call them in the bin. We aerate and we separate. Put them in the bin. We the bug and the slug and the beetle on our backs. We carry the bacteria like symbiotic taxis. Worms turn the dirt while we wiggle underground. Invertebrates are vigorously breaking it down. Down. Organic decomposers, break it all down. Table scrap disposers, break it all down. Composting composers, break it all down. Fungus and bacteria, invertebrates abound. We're the FBI, and we break it all down. Let's have a hand for whatever that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that worm. That was my idea. <laughs> uh, uh, my my two sons have I I have sucked them into uh, multiple multiple voice poetry for years and years to the point where when they were itty bitty kids, my son Simon in particular kept using he would say no more poetry puppet show. <laughs> he was just like sick to death of poetry. So then we did a poetry puppet show. But I'm, I'm about to run out of time before our, um, our Q&A section. So what I think I'm going to do is um, I, I'm going to skip the Jody call that my, my audience is here. They're not going to mind if I, if I skip that. And I'm going to do uh, a little poem. It's called The Eggplant Poem before I bring Jordan back here to do a final poem and, and a goodbye. But this is called Attila the Hen and the, Myst and the Mystical Eggplant. And if you don't know why an eggplant is called an eggplant, I didn't know that either. But there is an eggplant that looks like an egg. It is white, it is small, it is the shape of an egg. It looks like, and it was in some, some places called a garden egg. 
And that's where the name eggplant came from. But I thought it would be awfully funny if I actually wrote a poem about an eggplant that actually produced eggs and also involved chickens. I saw a um, uh, one garden up in, uh, this was uh, uh, Princeton Day School. They had chickens out in their garden as well. I know that, um, let's see, it was uh, Collegiate, Norfolk Collegiate also had chickens. I believe, was that chickens? I think they had chickens too. So, and uh, did they have chickens at Vance? Lucy Herring? Do you have herring chicken? Oh, you do. You have herring chickens. Okay. Well, we'll no, get. No, we no, no. All right. <laughs> See? Okay. I didn't think there were chickens. Um, but you should get chickens. You work on that. <laughs> Here, and you, after you hear this poem, you'll know for sure that you need chickens. It's called Attila the Hen and the Mystical Eggplant. My wife and I literally did have a chicken named Attila the Hen, and this is in her memory. There is a tagline underneath the title. It says, an absolutely true story that never happened. This is, by the way, a cowboy poem. And you'll hear it by, based on the specific rhythm and uh, rhyme scheme that it has. We had a pet chicken, Attila the hen. She lived 20 years and a day. We thought she might live to 100, but then our beloved old bird passed away. We buried Attila out back by the beans and we murmured a few solemn words. Then round in a ring, we all started to sing Kumbaya to that wonderful bird. The loss wasn't easy, but over the winter, time helped all our sorrow take flight. And later that May, on a magical day, we were met with a startling sight. Where Attila had been, there now stood a strange plant with magnificent feather-like leaves. It was bushy and round and made soft clucking sounds when its branches would brush in the breeze. We stood looking down at the plant we had found when our teacher cried out in surprise as we noticed some white shiny shapes catch the light, perfect eggs of a miniature size. Now when we eat breakfast, we think of Attila, the chicken who free-ranged and rambled. She left us a tree and a legacy we can enjoy over easy or scrambled. And thank you very much, audience. Thank you very much. So let's bring back Jordan. Uh, if, if we can, Patricia, um, there she is. Let's have a hand for Jordan. She's back with us. Jordan, I'm going to read one last poem. It's one of the last poems in the book, and it's based on an actual thing that happened in your garden. And, it, and, I, and I will tell you now, if you had chickens, this never would have happened because chickens <laughs> are excellent watch fowl. So um, this poem is called Someone Took the Garden Tools. Can you explain to us the real life story that this is based upon? Sure. Um, so a couple of years ago during the summer, someone broke into our garden shed and stole a couple of tools. They took the more prized possessions like our drool, our drills and um, our weed eater. And I posted it on, on Facebook, on our Facebook group that that had happened and the community stepped up and bought us new tools and someone came and put a sturdier lock on the shed. Um, it did happen a second time, but we, again, the community came like and helped us replace the tools and put an even sturdier lock on the shed. Mm -hmm. That's a, you know, it's a terrible story and yet it's a wonderful story too. And I heard that story and actually in the back of this book, there's a little note that says this happened to you, not just once, but twice. And um, I'm going to read this poem. It's called Someone Took the Garden Tools. The thing that really struck me about it was not the heinous act of somebody stealing a bunch of tools that help bring little kids joy, but that the community, of course, came together and actually tried to make it better. And that was just like touching. That was a poem that had to be written. And so here it is. And I dedicate this to you, Jordan. Uh, and all the, the people that uh, you have touched, you know, would like to dedicate this to you too. 
It's called Someone Took the Garden Tools, and it goes like this. Oh, by the way, if you look at it, it's very somber. And look, there's like a crow on the top. It's like, oh, very sad. It goes like this. Someone took the garden tools. Someone took the garden tools we keep inside the shed. Someone took the garden tools while we were home in bed. Someone took the garden tools, the only tools we had. Someone took the garden tools. Now all of us feel bad. The lady with a microphone, a lady with a microphone conducted interviews. Someone took the garden tools, we told the evening news. Next morning, when we went outside, the whole class stopped to stare. Our teacher wiped her eyes and cried to see what waited there. Spilling from the tool shed door were shovels, hoes and rakes, buckets, clippers, pruning saws, baling twine and stakes. A dozen pairs of rubber boots, a dozen pairs of gloves, and a note that said, to all of you, from all of us, with love. The sum of a community is greater than its parts. Someone took the garden tools, but could not take our hearts. The tool that can't be taken or replaced like all the rest. Your most important garden tool is beating in your chest. So yeah, that's for you. That's for you. And um, uh, let's have a hand for all of our readers who helped us out here. Um, Davis Reynolds, Simon Wolf, Ethan Wolf, Mars Mignon, uh, Ginger, Daisy, and Michael, our amazing audience. Um, and of course, uh, my special guest, Jordan Diamond. Let's have a hand for her. Uh, yeah, Patricia and Stephanie there at Malaprops who are making all this happen. Sprouts up to you. <laughs> uh, that's right, Alan. That's my gift to you today. Sprouts up. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Alan, for the bounty of your brain because yet again, you've grown another wonderful book and launched it here. And we're all so fortunate to, to have you. And I want to thank you uh, for Behold Our Magical Garden, poems fresh from a school garden. We have a few questions. Awesome. If you'd like to take some time to, to answer those, please. Absolutely. First questions for the two of you. Alan and Jordan, do you have gardens at home? If so, what do you grow? I'll take that first because my answer is probably shorter. Uh, you know, we had in our backyard, in a, we used to have the Falconhurst Community Garden, which grew into something really huge with, uh, I think, 90 families. It was, it was actually a huge community garden that was begun by Abby Walker in her backyard, really, and Abby and Ginger and Jen Murphy, our, our uh, neighbor down the street, uh, were the masterminds behind it. Now we have an herb garden out front that my wife tends to with tomatoes, um, rosemary, um, uh, uh, greens, lots of greens, lots of herbs, uh, some arugula, <laughs> which is really spicy, but I just love to say arugula, and some kale and some stuff like that. I guess the greens are just, the greens are wonderful. Uh, and lots of mint growing everywhere. How about you, Jordan? I bet you're really impressive. <laughs> um, yeah, there is a garden at my house. Um, my housemate who has lived here long before me, uh, she turned the entire front yard into a garden when a big tree that was shading it was cut down. And we have black raspberries, we have a blueberry bush and we have a huge elderberry bush there's a lot of herbs um and right now i've got some greens that are hiding under a row cover from the snow uh, we have a humongous walking onion patch and we have some arugula as well in the back um and 
We grow some some like common things like you know tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and greens, but we also like to experiment with uh, things like yacon and turmeric and ginger, which are um, interesting tubers that you grow um, and have to pull in in the winter. And there used to be a peach tree, but it got sick and it got cut down. Um, but yeah, we have a huge garden at our house as well. Wow. I mean, that, that question was just worth hearing the two of you say arugula, which, I, you know, wow, okay, I love it. And, the, and I even love the rutabaga, the way you said rutabaga earlier, Alan. So bring oh. it, bring it, <laughs> bring it. it. It's, it's great. Another question from friend of the store, former children's book buyer and esteemed author in her own right, Amy Cherix. Shout out to Amy Cherix, near and dear to our hearts. Keep rolling. Amy asks, that one tree poem took four decades to write. How long did it take to write the rest of them, Alan? Well, that's a very good question, Amy. Uh, poems, sometimes you can write a poem in a day, sometimes it takes 40 years, and that's the way poems are, and they're beautiful that way, because you can keep coming back to them, and a lot of times you'll write a poem, I just write a whole bunch of poems, and um, I'll set them aside, and sometimes I'll, I'll write them for a particular uh, collection, you know, a lot of the poems in this collection were actually from an earlier collection that had been rejected. It was called Step Outside. What do you see? A bird, a bug, a, a bumblebee. And I just began to kind of reshape and remold that into an actual garden. So a lot of these poems, sometimes it, it's a matter of, oh, I'm going to take that concept. I'm going to strip it down and I'm going to put a different chassis on it. And it's going to look a whole, very different then you end up having a concept because to create a collection of poems these days, you can't just say, I'm gonna write a collection of poems by Alan Wolf. You have to have a collection of poems that's based around a theme. And it's that theme that is the hook that allows people to decide whether they wanna buy the book or not. And so my hook was obviously uh, school gardens because I figured, and I think Jordan, give me two, th two sprouts up if you think that every school with a garden program should own this book, right? Okay, so I wanted to come up with something that people would really want, it would be very useful to them. And so I came up with all the poems I needed to place in the collection. And I knew I wanted a poem uh, about, about worms and composting. I knew I wanted a, a poem about um, uh, the Latin, Latin terms for things. And I knew I wanted a chicken poem because, you know, everything's got to have a chicken in it. And, and so I had plotted, if you don't mind the pun, I had plotted out a bunch of poem, subjects for poems. And because I had a deadline then, it was, you know, the, some of those poems rolled out really easily because now I was like working, I was working in concert with all the, the other poems and it had to have a context and I will say in, the, in, the, in the, the last comment about that is that many of these poems were written originally in different voices. And what I did was I switched a lot of the voices and the point of view so that they would be either from the vegetables themselves or from the kids who were part of the classroom. And so you hear a lot of them saying that we, and they talk about us, uh, and so there's a lot of that that wasn't there before because the context changed. That's an excellent question, Amy. You should keep keep working because one day you'll be a big success. <laughs> Amy Jerex <Yeah>. is great. <laughs> you saying? Well, I I think there's always room for puns. Anybody who can get away with the good, the bad, and the bugly needs to oh, oh, oh. keep rolling. <laughs> needs to keep rolling with the puns. And if, if there are not pun poems somewhere in that fertile brain of yours, Alan, I'll be surprised because I'm waiting, I'm waiting for that, for sure, for sure. You've got, you've got a super uh, fan of puns here. Another uh, question, which of course, this is a question that I had too, and I'm so glad that somebody else asked because I, it sounds a little scary. Uh, 
walking onions? Marilyn Estes asks, yikes, everyone. What's that all about? My, I added that part in there. What's that all about? Because I'm a little concerned. I don't know. That may be my next picture book right there. <laughs> the Night of the Walking Onions. Yeah. The Dawn of the Walking Onions. Uh, what's a walk? Uh, Jordan, what's a walking onion? <laughs> A uh, walking onion is a perennial type of onion. And I saw the question pop up in the chat. So I drew a little picture for y'all. <laughs> so what happens is, uh, you know, it looks like a regular onion. And then they grow these little onion bulbs on the tips of their leaves. And then the onion bulbs grow these like little green leafy searchy sprouts. And they get heavy and flop over. And then those little bulbs, they root wherever they landed and then they grow new leaves. And so it's kind of like the onion plant is walking around your garden and it's propagating itself. And that's why we have a yard full of onions now and you have to go and like dig them up and give them to your friends or cook them. Yeah, we have some at the oh. Herring Garden. I, I brought some from my house to the Herring Garden and planted oh. them. Jordan, if only I had known walking because it, it's like a slinky and you yes. could rhyme slinky and stinky oh it's just like it's like already we got to come up with volume two okay we'll start working on that we'll do that at the class you're coming to <laughs> yeah we're definitely gonna we're gonna take this into the classroom and we're gonna use all these things as prompts to get the kids writing about growing so that that'll be part of the, the curriculum. They're going to learn how to grow things, learn how to write about them. And uh, I'm going to learn a lot from Jordan just watching her work with the kids in the garden. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, Alan, let me, uh, in the last minutes that we may have together, we did get started just a, a little bit late. So we still do have some time. Uh, what uh, you talked a little bit about, you want this book to be in the schools and uh, we know you have some plans for propagating your message. So what is your big plan with your book? Where do, what's your vision for it? Uh, wow, that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that. I would like to sell as many as I possibly can. <laughs> And I, I got some claps from the audience, the live <laughs> audience like that answer. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they, they all know about me and money and, uh, you know, we're pretty intimate here. Uh, you know, I, I would really, I, I'm, I'm serious when I, I was struck by Davis, this fourth grader that I met, he obviously gets a lot out of, um, the garden. He apparently, according, according to Jordan, he shows up in the garden almost every day. And I know he's looking for a place of quietude where he can center himself. Um, there was a lot of talk about in these TED Talks this week about anxiety among these kids. And um, gardening is a great way to center yourself, get back to the earth. Uh, reading and writing also is because I believe that we write ourselves into existence and we, we can organize our thoughts through the act of writing and we can learn concepts when we write about them more than if we don't write about them. And so I think both gardening and writing are two things that are gonna help us, especially in this weird and crazy times to get centered again. So reading, writing and growing things. I'm really serious about that. I, I really do hope I can, um, work out a, a, a working curriculum that will bring reading, writing, and growing things together in, in schools all around the world. <laughs> that would be great. Well, I think that sounds wonderful. And I can't think of a, a better person to, to spearhead that uh, reading, writing, and gardening world movement than Alan Wolf. Another question has come in. Uh, Jordan, what are the children's favorite vegetables? <laughs> um, well, the kids always want there to be peppers in the garden. Um, 
So I have to teach them about other things that they can eat in times like this when it's cold. And they really get into the onion grass that grows wild in our grass. Um, and they love pea shoots and they love sour grass. And a lot of these are like wild weeds that we eat when there's not much else. Um, but I think the most beloved plant in our garden is our apple tree. Um, it is a five-star climbing tree and it was really sick for a long time with blight and it was close to climbing and the kids would all like go and ask it how it was doing and ask me how it was doing and give it hugs. Um, so I feel like the apples and the apple tree are like the most near and dear to their hearts. And Alan, what is your favorite vegetable? Um, <laughs> I really, I'm partial to broccoli actually. I like broccoli. I'm eating this carrot now, but I'm really partial to broccoli. And, you know, I'm a kale convert too. I never thought I liked kale until kale. And, and actually, you know, Malaprops was the first place I ever ate um, cilantro. I never tasted it until I was like 26 years old in Malaprops. So yeah. that's my favorite. You're full service. You know, it's all, you, you, some, you can get your greens. Yeah. You can feed your mind. I got my wife there too. She was like working there as a bookseller. And I, we went out on a date and got married. <laughs> Companionship. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that can happen in a bookstore, everybody, in case you're wondering. And well, I, will, uh, I will say this to in that, to wrap that whole thing up. There was something on the menu at Malaprops in those early days. It was called an Emeka bagel named after Emeka Barat, the owner, and it had a, the most beautiful purple onion on it. And I will never forget the look of that purple onion, the beautiful thing. So purple onions are also good. Well, I think that sounds savory and wonderful. And, and I uh, salute the, the walk down memory lane that, that tells us that bookstores are important in a number of ways in people's lives. And authors like you, Alan, are near and dear to our hearts. And Jordan, we appreciate what you and Feast and Bountiful Cities uh, bring to our communities. And thank you so much. Thank you, audience, for joining us today. This has been Alan Wolf's book launch for Behold Our Magical Garden. And I want to thank you, Alan. Any uh, final thoughts or parting crunches that you'd like to leave us with? No, I will just say this one thing that I like to sign off with, which is do good, be well, and metaphors be with you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us yeah. this afternoon.